Hello, and welcome to Let My People Eat, a podcast that provides satisfying talk about kosher nutrition. Here we clear through the clutter of nutrition speak, arm you with the clarity and confidence to eat, feel, and be your healthiest every day. I am Jill Sharfman, a board-certified holistic nutritionist living in Los Angeles. And I'm Dr. Andrea Moskowitz, a neuroscientist and psychiatrist in Los Angeles. I use my training and experience to integrate positive lifestyle changes into my patients' lives. Hey, Andrea. Hey, Jill. How's it going? It's going well. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, we're welcoming everybody back to our new season. And of course, it's the beginning of the new secular, secular new year. Right. And I know this is a time that a lot of people, almost half of the people make New Year's resolutions. And, uh... This is my question for you is, are you good at keeping your resolutions that you make? Do you make resolutions? Well, it depends what you call it, resolution. So I think, you know, a lot of people, resolutions, or you could call them, they're trying to either break old habits or make new habits. And and I think I used to do this and I don't do it anymore. I I have like a list of things I was going to try to accomplish, like all at one time. For me, that pretty much doesn't work. I have to take one step at a time and just break things down into small, manageable chunks for myself. And that's where I get the most success in doing things. 80% of New Year's resolutions fall fail within the first year. Right. In fact, 20% of them are broken by the first week of January alone. And we know that most people do want to lose weight. That is a big New Year's resolution. Right. right. Um, so anyway, I just, just to follow up on my question to you, I am terrible at keeping resolutions. I am what Gretchen Rubin would call somebody who is an obliger. Unless somebody holds me accountable other than myself, I am not very good at keeping, you know, any resolutions that I may, might make. Um, but this is why we're excited today to talk to our guest, um, nationally recognized registered dietitian nutritionist. Beth Warren is the founder and chief executive of Beth Warren Nutrition, a New York-based private practice. Beth has been sharing her kosher expertise and practical approach to healthy living for years. She has been featured on national and local television, radio programs, and print and online publications. She is the author of Living a Real Life with Real Food and Secrets of a Kosher Girl. She is also a wife and mom of six living in Deal, New Jersey. Hey, Beth. Hey, Beth. Hi. How are, How are you? you? We're good. good. Welcome to Let My People Eat. Thank you. We're good. so excited to Thank have you, you here. Um, Me too. The, the real kosher girl. <laughs> 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 so um, I guess start telling, tell me a little bit about how you got into this, why yeah. nutrition was your calling and setting up your, your practices. Yeah. Well, I always loved food. I mean, as a dietitian, people think it's quite the opposite. They think you're looking to take away food or you hate food. It's the opposite. I've always loved eating all kinds of food. Um, of course, even in our religion, you know, it, food is so central. So you're always around it. It's always exciting. It's always social. It's always fun. Um, so I always had that to be a part of me. And I also just loved helping people. And it was actually wasn't until after I graduated college that I felt like I wanted to use nutrition as um, something I'm going to do while raising a family. And I felt like I could help people through food. And that's so cool, because it's two things I love. And I just love to help people find their enjoyment with eating in a way that also makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. Um, In other words, like to be normal (laughs) with food and around food. So they don't always feel like they're on this diet or not on a diet. And they just really learn how to live with real foods. Yeah. So I'm guessing at this time of year, you see a, a ramp up. Is that, do you see a lot more people because it's January 1st, this arbitrary date that we've set that you get a lot mm-hmm. of more phone calls about people who are interested in weight loss? Yeah, definitely. Also, I mean, the seasonal holidays, even before that, even if people don't right. even celebrate them, but a lot of times with their work schedules are off and they came coming from a two week break. Um, these days, even if that looks a little bit different and people aren't necessarily traveling, they're home. Um, so people don't feel very good. You know, yeah, right. come January 1st, too. <laughs> they want to like kind of reset and, and go detox or whatever. And in conjunction with that, it's like, of course, I'm bringing in the new year with a new me and, you know, not necessarily a good thing per se, but people associate a new me with I have to look 
different too. And I think that's when it starts to set off the goals of wanting to lose weight. And as you guys were alluding to in your intro, when you're now only focusing on weight loss and the outside um, and how you look on the outside, it will not last. It will not last right? because it's so much more than that. So how do you help motivate people then to, to figure out that it's, it is not just about the external part. It is about changing their internal view. Right. Right. Um, I am actually lucky enough through my books and my platform that I, I increasingly see clients who come see me in our private practice that sort of already know what I'm about, meaning they won't, they come to me describing things like, I don't want to do the diets anymore. I can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm always back in the same place I am. I don't want to do this anymore. Like a very defeated, I just want to be normal around food feeling. So I'm already having them being very ready um, and motivated to want to do what we would call more of a lifestyle approach. So the first thing I would do to help motivate someone is to correct their language. So actually even starting on that basic thing of when people start throwing out the word diet, 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 I'm always like, okay, we're not doing a diet. You know, you're really just learning how to eat and how to feel good around food. Yeah, that will also result in weight loss. You know, right. guess what? Weight loss is secondary to just having a healthy mind and body. And um, you actually take a lot of the pressure off when you start to think of it like that. Because to be so solely focused on just food is very pressuring. And just how you look is very pressuring, especially if you're your own worst judge, you know, even me, I'll look, I'll be like, Oh, look at that wrinkle in that picture. And other people will be like, what are you talking about? You don't have wrinkles. And you know, that's really, really a lot of pressure. So I try to help them realize like just how good you want to feel and other things that might be going on in their life. You know, our initial assessment is them really talking about a lot of things. I ask a lot of questions about like stress levels and what's going on in their lives. And Um, you know, I get to really know them on a very personal level of things that they might have even not realized to open up to me about, um, because they realize they just ultimately want to just feel good. Feel good. Right. Right. Yeah. We also want to look good, but we want to feel good. We want to feel good. It's so interesting because whenever we have a guest on, um, Mm -hmm. I always try and test out their products. I test out their plan. I've had several other registered dietitians on, um, that I, but as I was going through and reading your book, it's what I do. Your mm-hmm. your approach and your right. plan is just really eating good, normal, healthy foods. There's no restricting entire food groups. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no deprivation. It's it's a really good way to to approach this whole thing. And when Andrew and I talk about diet, right. we talk about what you're eating every day. Right, it, it, that it, kind of diet. Right, not, diet, not a losing weight diet, not, but a diet exactly. Is a, right. Diet meaning way of eating. Yeah, right. they always correct people's uh, right. definitions and language. That was my first book was actually correcting that word. Right. right, diet became to mean something so negative. I also talked about it in that chapter. That was the first book, Living a Real Life with Real Food. Same thing happened to the word fat, right? Now we're still right. afraid of the word fat. Fat's a food group. Fat is not right. used to describe a person. <laughs> um, so I always correct the language. I just find it starts at that basic level, especially in children. Right. Um, so I, I'm really up, like, that's like a thing I have. Um, okay. Well, do you, you, know, other do you that, see children in your practice? Yes, yes. We treat okay. all ages. Yeah. Um, I actually just before getting on the phone with you guys, I uh, was talking first with a mom. I would I first like to talk to the like the caregivers um, to get a, just a background. And then I start working with the child, even if they're as young as six. Um, but this this child was nine years old. Nine years old is a great age to they really start to. Um, first of all, they have a stronger self image. So they start to feel insecurities. I find around that eight, nine age very strongly. And they want to kind of reach out for help, which is cute because if they go to the right person, it's cute. If they don't go to the right person, it's right. not cute. No. But luckily they'll come to me and, um, you know, we work through that, you know, so you have a great opportunity to work on body image and um, the value of health and being healthy and how to incorporate all the foods you want and just, and just learn, you know, I explain that when they go to school and they have a math test, like you can't take that without learning the chapter first, mm-hmm. you know, that's right. not you don't know what you're doing. And, and, and now, you know, we have to learn it like with anything else. And it starts to make sense that this is just sort of learning. And, um, and of course I wouldn't know what to do. Like, I don't have to feel out of control. Like, of course it doesn't make sense to me. Um, and they just learn and, um, it's a very, very balanced approach. That's not weight focused specifically. We explain what weight means in context of 
growing and growth and maturity um, and especially in children. And I, and I help them see that, you know, so it, it, you still see this in adults, but even more so with kids when they just throw out a random number of what they're supposed to weigh, quote unquote, mm-hmm. you know, and it's such a random number and, and you just try to help them understand the concept of what weight is and what it's really measuring and how, how it could be a tool. And it's also not even a useful tool. Sometimes it depends. Um, right. It really helps measure growth. So it's, um, it's really an opportunity there. But when you mentioned my, my book, Secrets of a Kosher Girl with the Plan, it's funny because if you sort of, you would know how to read through it, but it's positioned as a 21 day plan. Like you guys pointed out, it, it's, it, I think it works nicely off the marketing of having people want to pick up the book, but I hope, and this is my goal when they read through it and they embark on the plan that they learn so much more about themselves mm-hmm. and so much more about, aha, uh-huh, you're making it sound like this, but really this is just being normal. You know, <laughs> right? Well, you talk, right. you have a lot of. I love the mindfulness exercises you have before each day of the plan, like things from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, or um, I, I'm trying to think of other things. But there are a lot of yeah. good quotes in there, and you you tell people to read this and kind of absorb that information and what, like, you know, think good and it will be good. Like if you set mm-hmm. yourself up to say, "Oh, I might fail on this diet plan," then you probably will fail. But if you think right. good. Um, then you probably will be successful. So I love that you you bring that mindfulness in, into it. Also, you do have a very holistic approach. You do talk right. about exercise and sleep. And I think when people make a lot of these resolutions, it, it may not be just about weight loss. It's really about living a healthier lifestyle right. in general. So Yeah. I also really like that aspect of it because, again, it makes it feel less pressuring than just being about food, which also allows you to develop a healthier relationship with food. So like, for example, we recently came off a of Hanukkah and, and I had a client today who was recalling her Hanukkah that she, um, she felt like her food, you know, could have been better, but she, it was ultimately Hanukkah and she had donuts and she had whatever. And, and, but what helped her not even feel so bad about it. And, and yeah, she gained one pound, but what helped her feel better about it after the fact and her going right back on track was, She's like, but my exercise was spot on and I drank water, uh-huh. you know, like I got in my cups a day and I loved that because even though she felt like a little bit like she slid back a drop from the one pound of weight gain, she didn't feel so defeated. She felt like I could just pick up and move on because I still felt like I was doing something. You know, I felt like, and that's exactly what I want to teach people is that there's always something you could do. And it doesn't have to just be around food. You can have a holiday or a new year's or whatever everybody's working on right now. And you could still balance it out with the other areas of wellness that literally affect your weight. People think, oh, okay, yeah, you just want me to be healthy. Well, yeah, I do. But it also (laughs) affects your weight, um, just those areas. And if you could say, I want to have a donut, I want to have a this, I want to have a that. You could then prop up the other areas of wellness, get your, you know, sleep well, you know, would go to sleep an hour earlier, you know, get your water drinking and go get the workout you've been putting off. If you could kind of incorporate these other areas of wellness that also affect weight, you don't have to feel so pressured by the food because it's, that's a slippery slope. You know, it's impossible not to indulge. You don't want to be that person that sits there and doesn't indulge if you want to. And then you just pick up where you left off because that was only little one little area that just needed to be put more focus on. And once the opportunity presents itself, we pull ourselves out. And that's what this new year should be for everyone too. It's like, all right, we had our little vacation. Let's uh, right. So yeah, let's push through it. So you brought up something interesting because there's there's a lot of chatter, especially in our community on social media, about um, intuitive eating. Um, and, and how that approach works. So somebody who mm-hmm. would practice intuitive eating might say, you know, you had the donut, so don't drink more water. Don't, don't get the extra sleep. It's okay. You had the donut. Mm-hmm. How would you answer that's a that? Gr- that's a great point because conceptually, I love the concept of eating intuitively, right? You know, that's my whole appro- approach about mindfulness. And mm-hmm. I, I brought that up from my bringing up being brought up as a kosher girl, so to speak, because it's more of a lifestyle. You know, we're very focused on the food in in terms of setting an intention and saying a blessing before we eat. And a lot of these mindfulness aspects are something that are very intuitive to us. And that's how I've always related to intuitive eating. Right. And I like, I like where it ends there, meaning 
once you start saying how you should or shouldn't like do what feels very balanced to you, you mm-hmm. know, then, then it becomes, again, it feels more shame. It feels shameful. It feels um, like maybe you're doing something wrong, but it, yeah, it feels right to you. So I think there's always a balance um, in any approach, any approach. And I think that I, the, the definition of wellness, let's say, you know, is, is those other areas, like what we know to impact lifestyle, um, lifestyle prevention is sleep, smoking, you know, um, hydration, you know, all these aspects that are just proven in science to be very helpful for weight and ultimately make you feel good. So I don't think there's anything wrong or shaming with wanting to be balanced in that approach. When ev- it's all about the mindset, by the way, whenever your mindset starts to be more like I'm working out to punish myself, or to deduct calories, then I, then I don't, I agree. I agree that it's going in the wrong direction. But when you're saying, I want to feel good overall, and therefore I'm going to continue with my workouts and continue with my drinking my water. And, and yeah, I totally want to indulge on my donuts right now. I think that's just a very balanced approach. And I don't think you have to feel ashamed either way, as long as your mindset feels like you're doing something that feels good. And I think we could all be honest about that. You know, like, when I, I feel like we all would know what I mean when I say you want to make your mindset just feel like you're doing something good right. for yourself if you yeah. are honest with that right. feeling. And yeah. I, I think for a lot of people, it's making that that distinction between being successful and being perfect. So I think a lot mm-hmm. of people, sometimes they conflate those two things and they're like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I have to do this, 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 and this, and I can't deviate. And then it, like, you know, perfection is really the enemy of success. Mm-hmm. There's that saying, you know, so then it's like they, so of course, like, we're not, of course, they, they, you know, they do, they're a little bit off. They do, and then they just, oh, forget it. Yeah. You know, and like scrap the whole thing. Right. And it's like, uh, like, like you don't have to do that. Like you can eat your donut and still like drink your water and have your workout, mm-hmm. get enough sleep or, you know, whatever it is, the other things that also make you feel good. Right. So yeah. Beth, how do you approach yeah. the scale? Because I want to talk a little bit about your in-body, you know, measurements yeah. and all yeah. that kind of stuff. I have a funny meaning. Okay. So I, I pers- okay, personal level, I don't own a scale. I don't have one in my house. I don't, I, I've never even felt any need to, you know, I guess I'm lucky in that sense where I, I've always just felt very like nonchalant about it. It doesn't, it does, it doesn't really affect me. Um, to the point where I ever felt this like such a strong tie that some people placed on it that I really like to explore with them why it became something so, um, you know, connected to everything. Um, so, well, first of all, I'm an insurance based practice. So ultimately I have um, charting things that I, I have to record and stuff. But even even that sense, um, I always talk to clients before um, they weigh in if they weigh in. I'll get to that part later. But um, there are so many clients that just jump, come in. They're like, okay, let me ju- just jump on the scale, especially like their first follow up. And I'm like, no, sit, let's chill, let's talk. Let's, I feel like that's a, a leftover chat. from the Weight Watchers era where people oh, would yeah. go into yeah. the. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, because I, especially in kids, but I like them to see that um, that what happened that week matters much more to me than what that number says. And how I know how it usually goes usually is that whatever they describe to me about their week, I usually know where the scale went because mm-hmm. it's such a secondary thing. It's right. so not the focal point. It's so secondary to whatever happened in the week. And sometimes like we have our weekly Sabbaths or Shabbat and um, you know, everyone eats heavier and I want them to, by the way, I want you to eat a normal meal. You know, I, we talk about ways to help that be manageable and all that, but I, I don't make you sit with your little piece of grilled chicken with pepper on it. I want you to eat your food. I'll teach you how to do that. But um, I would never tell somebody, first of all, I don't let, I really, I tell them if you want to really work with me, I don't want you weighing yourself at home. You know, I try to work with clients who are again, so connected to it, but um, I won't throw them out, but I'll tell them I do not. And once they start rattling off numbers that they see at home, I cut them off and I don't listen. I'm like, this means nothing to me, nothing. Cause it doesn't say anything about your progress of what you ate, Mm -hmm. nothing that shows any fluctuations, body fluctuations, going to the bathroom, saltier foods you ate later at night. I don't know what it is. They have a whole blog post on this, by the way, of what the scale shows. So I use it, I teach them that it's a tool. It's one tool in your repertoire and it's not an indicator of whether or not you did good or bad. So 
sometimes if someone's really anxious or doesn't really feel terrible about their week and, and for some reason would feel worse going on that scale, I tell them to skip it. Absolutely skip it. I don't need to know. We already know it went up. You know what I mean? Like, what do we need to see the number for? Just give yourself another week. Not a big deal. Um, sometimes in a way it could be helpful, like meaning they might feel like that, that they did so terrible. And I feel like they really didn't do that terrible. And then they go on the scale and see they really didn't do that terrible. So as much as I don't want to always play that game, there are some times where I use it to show like, just chill. <laughs> Next time you feel this way, you don't have to go on the scale to prove it, but at least you see that. And that's when you brought in my in-body machine. I found my, I have an in-body weight analysis machine that the software is very, um, helpful, meaning it's a really good software behind it that helps me that it's pretty accurate to, to follow trends and patterns. Um, so it doesn't just drive us crazy or drive people crazy. And I found that using something like that helps open up the conversation way more than just being one number and what that one number means. Because what the in-body shows is um, fluid levels and it shows um, muscle mass in the various parts of the body and it shows their fat um, uh, the specific fat percentage. And then it also measures their, their basal metabolic rate. Mm. And, um, and that even that number, according to this software is based off their age, their height and their muscle mass. So it's a variety of factors that create that number. And then it gives a specific fat loss goal and muscle goal if needed in terms of gaining muscle mass. So that's a lot. Like that's a lot in there yeah. to right. unpack. And, I and that's why also I want to say, I just always like to reiterate, if somebody's going to go down this path and they, they want to change right. their lifestyle and become more healthy, it's always good to work with somebody who is trained in this area. Exactly. Because, you know, like Beth was saying, you might get on and the weight might say something. You might look at a BMI chart and... Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. The oh, BMI. Yeah, the BMI. <laughs> I know. We, like, we've, yeah. we've talked about this ad nauseum, probably, yeah. um, how the BMI yeah. is not necessarily a good indicator. Um, but there's a lot of education that's involved. And that's why it's good to talk to somebody who's trained to help you with this. Um, right. So you yeah. don't get frustrated. You, you don't get on this dieting roller coaster that you just keep yeah. on, you know. Right. Like one thing I'd mentioned right off the bat that I always point out, you know, I always like to focus on positive things, even with weight, even with obesity. Like I, I look for somebody to still feel good about something going on. Um, is that ultimately the fact of the matter is when someone is carrying more weight or obesity, you do have a very strong muscle mass. And Believe it or not, a lot of people are super surprised to hear that and see that. And that would be always the first thing I point out is that even though you feel like you're a high number and sure, we have fat to lose, we know that, um, you have so much muscle and it's such a nice feeling. Like they feel like, you know, I describe, I say you're a walking gym, weight, weight, the weight at the gym externally or weight on you is ultimately still weight. And it makes them feel good because I describe it that I'm sure when you walk down the block, you're huffing and puffing and you don't want to walk anymore. And you're like, what the heck is wrong with me? And this person next to me is not huffing and puffing. And I feel so crappy about myself. And I don't want to ever move ever again. because It's just terrible. And, and I'm like, well, that's because you're lifting a lot more weight than someone like me is lifting walking down the block. You're doing 4 billion times the amount of work I'm doing. Right. You're not breathing heavy just for the sake of breathing heavy. You are literally lifting weights. And it just makes them feel very validated and good about right. something, you know, because there's such good things to say about a lot of muscle mass. And that makes your metabolism faster. And then you can eat more and not have to be, like you said, so perfect to start right. because you are burning faster. And, you know, it just, it doesn't always have to be so bad. Like you right. don't have to, I don't believe any change, especially long-term comes from a place of negativity. So anything good I could point out to somebody, even about their weight, even if you have what to lose is going to only be a good thing. And I use that test for that. So to, to your point, Jill, you know, going to someone, not only who, who has a test like that or whatever, but I see people who have the test that clinically have no idea how to apply it. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I look like I use that as a tool to help the conversation. And I'm sure that other people may not, but I, I don't take advantage of that opportunity. I make sure to point out and even their fat loss goal they give. I tell people, let's say I'm dealing with a 40 year old woman with six kids and no, no, no. I'm like, look, this fat loss goal is trying to get you to be when you were 18 with no other responsibilities in life right. and you had nothing else to do. So we're not going for that goal. I always tap on another 10, 15 pounds for that anyway. You know, so I automatically like 
fix the test. You know, it's not like I take it at face value. I apply it to whatever this person's going through. But it's also really cool to point out like inflammation when their fluid levels are past a certain level. I'm like, what's going on? I'm always, and then it shows up. It's a flaw of the test, but it's actually helpful. It shows up in their muscle mass distribution, where if they're retaining a lot of fluid in their legs, it looks like extreme. And I'm like, are your legs swollen? And they're like, yeah, and I'm like, so swollen. And then I got to find a doctor who's going to take that seriously. And, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. you know, that type of result. Um, usually I send them to a podiatrist, believe it or not, the ones who kind of take that that result serious, even though it should be cardiologists and things like that. Yeah. But um, it's very helpful if you know how to read it and, yeah. and also listen to what's going on with the client. It, it usually works hand in hand. Yeah. Um, Andrea and I were having a debate because I love that in your Secrets of a Kosher Girl book, you are very specific at each meal, what to eat and uh, the recipes and everything's in a, a really great little package there. Uh, that's yeah. how I like, that's how I would approach things. Just tell me what to do and I will do it. Yeah. Andrea, on the other <laughs> hand, was like, uh, I just need kind of a framework and yeah. then I could go. Do you find that with okay. your clients? Yeah, I'm like kind of laughing because <laughs> I, I totally see every world, you know, like obviously we're all different, right? right. So I feel like my first book was more general, right? It was like sort of like here's meal plans and whatever. Um, it was more of a lifestyle based book. I said, I actually developed secrets of the kosher girl for the people who are very diet focused. I, I, I did it on purpose. Like meaning I want to break them out of that without making them feel like they're, there's no way I'm, I'm never going to do something like that, you know? So I did make it very specific on purpose. Um, <laughs> Someone actually gave me feedback, let's say, saying that the maintenance chapter, they were hoping to be more specific. I was like, that's the point, though. I don't I want you to take everything you learned about being so specific and saying this is what worked for me and what didn't work for me. And this is what I want to continue doing because it felt good. And that was like already for people like, what do I do now? You know, um, so I hear both of you. I hear it <laughs> and I did it on purpose. Um, I am actually had a client today who, who it was really fun. You, you see some of these people who become clients. She's like die hard, like really does it. Her and her husband, like on and off and she loves it. She was a weight watchers for years, years, like honorary member or whatever they call them. And, um, and she still kind of is, but she, thank God eats foods with fat now and does, you know, doesn't save mm -hmm. her points for the night. So, um, she's like really, really balanced right. approach with it, but now she became a client and she's asking me such specifics that I was actually sweating about. I was like, but look, you have to understand. I designed the book. Like if you didn't have me and I also needed to be sure of a bunch of things. Cause I told her, I was like, have an ounce of dark chocolate sugar, but in the book you said I had, I was like, so I have to know oh. it's going to work Interesting. for me never meeting you ever, uh -huh. you know, so right. very limited right. and very you know, so definitely when you work with me, um, specifically, I can make it more specific, which, which should make sense, you know? Right. So right. it's the rigidity, I get it. It's totally like that, but it was like that on purpose. And, yeah. um, yeah. and, and then it's supposed to be like, what'd you learn from this that you want to continue? And that's why I only would recommend it for the three week. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I don't expect people, I call my plans, let's say a skeleton plan. It starts with the model of what that story is, but it, I expect it to unfold week to week. It's the opposite. Like people might think that it becomes, you know, other diets or whatever. This is just what I do forever and ever. But I look for things to come up on purpose. Like, right. you know, what's going on for you? You know, this person today, she lost already 22 pounds and, she, and it's just so nice because the longer you're on it, she, you know, just working with me, the more, and I tell people this all the time, the more you're going to on your own start to incorporate things that you feel like you're missing. It's such a beautiful thing in the beginning. You won't understand how you're comfortable doing that. And you'll look to me to tell you, and I hate that. I will not tell you what extras to put in. That's the whole point right. is that that comes from you. And it's so scary for people, but now she started incorporating two, like two handfuls. She said of, let's say she called them sun chips or something that she was really missing her chips. And she puts it with her, with her hummus, her hummus as a snack. She was really missing it and she's still losing and it's twice a week and she knows exactly what she's doing and she's loving it. And she's very happy. I'm like, I much rather that right. come from you. I feel sure. like that's coming back to the intuitive eating. Uh, yes. Piece. Yes. Right. So she's, you've actually helped her get to that part where she has become more of an intuitive eater. Um, you right. know, because we're talking about resolutions, um, and, and you both alluded to this, to have the, what we call a SMART goal. So yeah. a specific, mm -hmm. measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely thing. So in other words, you don't want to just say, oh, I need to lose 15 pounds. You want to say something, I will eat 
fruit and I want I right. eat fruits and vegetables with every meal, or I'll make my lunch and bring it, um, right. you know, that way. So, yeah. do you is that something? I, yeah. yeah, and I actually love the examples you brought up, and I think that this is a flaw with the whole res- resolution thing. It's like you can't do something that doesn't sound like you at all. Like, don't right. even say that. Like, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't say, I'm going to lose 50 pounds by March. And it's like, you'd normally have difficulty losing one. So right. you have to do something like, I don't even, I wouldn't even make it numbers focused. I would do things right. like you said, Jill, to get you to a lower number. Like, yes. I actually never tell people a goal per se. Um, I say about or whatever, because it's really going to be up to you. You know, it's what, it's what things you're going to want to put into place that you achieve to get you to the next phase of that. And I think that doing actionable things, like you're saying, right. Um, not just measurable, but like actionable things is, um, is really key here and things that make sense. I always just one up it even on myself. Um, I have, let's say a baseline of where if you follow my Instagram, like I'm I very do. into my workouts. I like also, I train in boxing, like I'm very into it. Yeah. So if I you have guys, like a you baseline. Guys should, you should follow Beth on Instagram. She's okay. at Beth Warren. It is, I find it so yeah. inspiring watching you in the boxing yeah. ring. It's Thank just you. Very, yeah. Beth underscore Warren. Beth yeah. underscore. I, and I know that looks like for other people, let's say extreme, but I have my baseline. I'm like, okay. And then I one up it by maybe adding like a sparring class during the week sometimes when I could like push myself to do it or my schedule changes and then I do the push. So I think that like, that's only one upping it for me. That's not like all of a sudden, like I never boxed in my life and I'll be like, I'm going to start sparring. You know, it's like, no, you're adding a little bit extra to what you, wherever you're at, that is going to get you closer to your ultimate goal. You know, do you have your clients track uh, what they eat? during the week, but when they, before they okay. see you? Yeah. I, I, again, I, it's all how you approach it. Meaning this, like I, I had a client today, I'm working with a very long time. So I was actually a little surprised to hear this because now she's pregnant and I still work with people through pregnancy. We do amazing. Like she's, it's just so like empowering to, to, you know, work with all the things like we work on while you're pregnant. It feels very good. Um, but she was saying that this week was hard for her and she felt she felt uncomfortable even writing the food logs. She didn't want to write down um, the the quote unquote bad things that she ate. And and that's a big red flag for me. And I told her, look, just write it on the paper because once we get into this, I, I can't even face it writing it down. It's all other kind of worms that you just want to be, feel really cool, calm and collected about writing it down because this is literally just information for me. Like I, if we're, all the stuff we're talking about today is like how, how focused I am on the actual person and, and what I see them doing in order to make my recommendations because I want to see what you're doing. Do you get, like, do you have I want them, it to be for you. So, sorry. Do you have, do you get into the emotional aspect of it? Like- yeah. So I tell them to write everything. Like I, it also depends. Like if someone's coming to me for GI issues, which I deal with a lot. And especially after this whole quarantine situation, a lot of flare ups for people who've never had issues, probably from stress and sleep and all this stuff. Um, I tell them they should really forget about my paper, go get a journal, you know, write everything out. <laughs> Um, A lot of things are stress related anyway, Um, but especially if you're also now having symptoms, GI symptoms because of stress, um, let's say, or triggered by stress, then, um, you know, it's all going to matter. So I really have to know what's going on in your day and, um, or if you could like recognize something happened and I tell them even to start it because sometimes, again, we got to meet people where they are. They don't really realize the therapy aspect of this job, um, or at least when they come to me. So I'm not just going to all of a sudden be like, write out all your feelings in your journal. when they're like, I just wanted to be told what to eat. So I'll tell them like something like star, if like something strange comes up or you feel something weird. And then if they do that, then I could bring it up in the visit. Like what, what, what's, what's up, you know? Um, but I only find it helpful to write, I call it a food and mood journal or whatever. I tell them to track their water. The times that they eat is important for me to see. Um, and, and every, you know, things like that. I tell them it's really just my information to be able to guide you better, but I've only found it helpful probably because of how I practice. I know it could be triggering for some people. If I ever identified that, I would cut it for sure. But like, I always get people in a very good place about writing things down because I think that, again, that intuition, it's more from that aspect. And I explain even to kids, because especially kids, they write everything I want to see on the paper. Some of them are really cute. They don't care. It's so cute when they get to the place where they write Slurpees and cakes. And I'm like, this is great that they could just write it all down and feel very normal next to their salad. And like, I love that. 
but I get people to feel very comfortable with being like, like owning, you know, what they ate, whatever it was. It's not a grade. I don't not grading it. I explain to kids, I'm not a teacher, you know, like that, meaning I'm not grading their paper. Um, so I really just make sure to put people in the right frame of mind about what things really are and aren't. And I actually like that. I like, I look forward to fixing that in, in the way people are feeling. It's so interesting yeah. because I, went back to school, I became a board certified holistic nutritionist, and I am trained to do one on one counseling. And people Mm -hmm. always approach me and they say, Oh, do you see people one on one? And I say, I do not because I don't have that therapy gene that you were talking about that you really need Mm -hmm. to get into people's heads and minds about why they're making certain decisions um, about the foods of the foods they eat when they eat why they eat. And um, so that's why I like having an expert like you on who who is good at that and knows how to delve into those topics and those ideas and guide them. Yeah, thank you. But it takes time, meaning like I got to get that trust, you know, because like I said, they're they ultimately still feel like they're just going to get a list of foods. But I'm really looking to help somebody, you know, and and I know that they'll follow what I say. But then what why does this keep not working? And 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 a lot of them also sort of like I said they come to me knowing that but they don't really mm-hmm. understand uh, like what it's going to take you know and it really takes time because it takes time to unfold the specifics and I tell that's what I tell people like you'll make it sound so overwhelming I'm out of control at night but once you go through this you realize things that get more specific like okay well I didn't I haven't eaten since twelve and I get mm-hmm. home and I didn't realize how stressed I am with like all the kids running on top of me and like and then they I didn't realize that because I don't have like a snack out for myself, I'm eating their food, like we could boil it down. So it's not so overwhelming. And that takes time. And and a lot of people, you know, every everything holistically takes time, you know, right, right. You so time. yeah, you one of the big tips, because I think people are going to want to walk away from this episode going, Okay, so what what am I supposed to do? Right? <laughs> We've talked about a lot mm-hmm. of things. So one of them is planning. Like, mm-hmm. like you said, don't put yourself in a situation where it's dinner time and you made dinner for the kids and you have nothing for yourself to eat. Um, and we'll find your motivation. What's, mm-hmm. what's the reason you want to lose weight or be healthier, you know, and that's again, a place where an RD or can help help with that and also provide you support and let you know that if you did have a day where you fell off the wagon, so to speak, it's okay. Mm-hmm. And it can mm-hmm. it can be a it, it can still work. Uh, set real setting realistic goals, like you said. Don't lose try and lose fifty pounds by March. That's not a realistic okay. goal. Um, and uh, yeah, just just being smart about the approach. I want to go back to one thing you said with the kids. When you work with kids, do you also work with the parents since they're kind of the yeah. gatekeepers? Um. Yes, obviously, but how depends on the family dynamic that I feel I'm being introduced to. Mm -hmm. Um, I will tell you this. It never works. If you feel like your one kid has a problem and you're making it feel like a, it's a problem. And two, it's just this kid and everybody else is eating snack foods all over the place. You know, it definitely has to be a a family network dynamic. And, and luckily also we are insurance based. We, a lot of times see the rest of the family as even just the child starts coming. And I love that Mm because you want to for sure work with the entire family dynamic. Um, So it becomes more like just normalized way of eating. It's not anything like someone, someone so is on a diet. So absolutely. There's an aspect of that. Um, There's, I basically play with both meaning, especially if a child young, the parent, or a caregiver is there with them. If it starts to feel overpowering and they're answering only for them, then I'll ask the parent to like step out or to come a little bit later in once I develop the trust because then I want the child to be talking to me, you know? Um, so it really depends, but of course you're working with both. And then if I am seeing, especially a teen, let's say, and then the parent starts coming less and less with them, I touch base with the parent, um, especially if I don't see things that we're discussing in the office, like, um, you know, have vegetable at dinner, but the mom's not buying vegetables. Like there's a a disconnect because ultimately kids are still kids. So they're not in control of everything that's going on their plate, which is why I explain you should never give a goal of a steady weight loss, you know, anyway, for kids, because they go to a birthday party, they go to their friend's house, you know, they mommy meet whatever for dinner Thursday night. It's not, they don't have everything in their control, nor that should they, but 
if we're discussing have a veggie, you know, let's try new vegetables and they like have zero in the house, there's like a disconnect there. I would have to understand and then I would reach out to the parent. So I would say, it's, of course, a combo of both because a child cannot do this without support. And the ones that sort of just drop them off, quote unquote, <laughs> like fix them. It's not, it's not gonna anything. Gonna work. I mean, I, I have kids with speech therapy. I have kids, you know, who do all that. And, and any therapist would say that you have to, you know, implement things at home and, you know, the child needs support. So I always explain to kids because whatever we agree to in the visit, okay, we're going to try a cucumber this week. And then mommy's on board to, to buying the cucumber and mommy cuts up the cucumber for you. And mommy packs the cucumber <laughs> for you. And I said, all you need to do is eat that cucumber. But like, that's your job. You need to eat it because that's what you agree to. But you know, your mom is the shopper, the prepper, the this, the this, the that. So it comes to the parent, um, all the work, absolutely. But then the child's little job is just to eat it and, and they have to hold, you know, accountable for that too. So that's, it's a, absolutely a team effort. And the approach to that just depends on, you know, the family. Can you um, give me an example of a typical day of food under you know, just a typical day. I know everybody yeah, has different sure. likes, wants. Yeah, but what would be a typical day that you would recommend? Sure, sure. Well, one thing with what you guys said with the structure of what I was doing, and I know, um, you know, some people like to just be told, let's say, eat three dairies a day or whatever it is. I, I, I like to ensure that each meal and snack is balanced so that they're, I know they feel full and satisfied in the moment. So I know that if other things come up, in the day, it could be triggered from something else, like emotional or, or other signs of quote unquote hunger. I wrote an email about that recently, like stress or other other things um, coming up because I, I know like from a macronutrient perspective or, you know, that there was protein there, there was fiber there, you know, it wasn't really that you were hungry. It was like, what else is going on? Maybe it didn't do it for you or, or whatever. So that's why um, I build the plans like that in general. Like I don't just give it a free for all. I try to help guide each meal and snack separately. So Anyway, um, I would, I like to learn, teach people how to incorporate foods with fat. Um, it's very important to me. So sometimes I just refer to them as plant-based proteins, but I would do, let's say, let's say you could do an avocado toast for breakfast. Um, I like to focus on high quality foods for many reasons, but also because I know that it would be satisfying. Um, so like a sprouted grain bread with a half an avocado or those baby little Trader Joe's avocados mm-hmm. are really cute. Um, veggies are, I don't ever want to make people think twice. So tomatoes, whatever does it for you. Um, and a small fruit on the side, like a, like a clementine. Cause I like to just teach people how to incorporate fruits throughout the day and get a balance in. Um, then my snacks are always a combo of something with protein and fiber and fiber is not necessarily a food group fibers in foods. So that also broadens your options from doing fruits, vegetables, or even whole grains, if that's what does it for you. But I try to incorporate the fruit and veggie aspect. So just give me an example. Like, yeah. 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 With like a, a tablespoon of a natural peanut butter and an apple. So let's say you start avocado toast with like clementine or something, then an apple with peanut butter. I always endorse a load of veggies at your meals. So I would, let's say, call it a salad um, with tuna and like some plant-based source of carb I love also like um, chickpeas have a lot of fiber um, sweet potato or butternut squash cubes you know some of those sort of carbs in your salad and then in the afternoon I do something like the hummus and carrots idea is really nice and satisfying um, it's also people's hardest times especially like moms like three thirty four. Mm-hmm. so I like when they sit down and eat something substantial and dinner like a salmon um, you know a butternut squash soup and string beans I don't know you know like a veggie some sort of like uh, again I like plant-based carbs to be more satisfying like more filling versus like your little bit of noodles you know not that you can't have them just I find I like to eat volume of things and um so plant-based carb the piece of salmon and veggies and then after dinner it's optional you know that's when I work on that intuitive work you know yeah. What do you need? What do you want? Nah. It's, you literally um, just described what I ate yesterday. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, awesome. yeah, that's really, really funny. That's but awesome. you did leave out your elixir that you recommend in the book. Yes, I love doing like lemon, um, lemon and mint leaves in, in water. Mint, mint is very anti bloating. Lemon's just really nice um, way to balance things. Um, so it's, and it helps you hydrate. And people right. who quote unquote don't like water, it adds some flavoring without adding sweeteners, which right. I'm a big fan of trying to add flavor, not sweeten. Things. Right. And that's first thing in the morning to have that. And mm-hmm. again, going back to Lubavitcher Rebbe, he did start his day every day with hot water and lemon. That's I know so, yeah. so much. Yeah. So much good stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So much. All right. Well, Beth, thank you so much. This is such a treat. 
talking to you, the real kosher girl. Um, I want to remind everybody that you can find Beth uh, on her Instagram at Beth underscore Warren. You're also at Beth Warren Nutrition dot com. Yes. And I have a blog there, too, with recipes. OK. Um, um, and you can out. follow me on Instagram at Jill H. Sharfman. Did you have any parting thoughts that you would like to leave our audience no with. i just i just think if there's anything we've learned you know new year new you should be like there's nothing wrong with the old you just focus on you more you know what you what you really feel intuitively you know <laughs> the definition of intuitive and what feels right to you and just um you know sit with that and act on it right and i feel like you can also start anytime somebody was doing this five for thrive yeah. back you know, a couple of months ago that you don't have to wait until January 1st right. to Mm-mm. start no. keeping healthy habits. And that's habits. the thing. With, yeah. And with my plan is each day you wake up and say something and set an intention. So every day could be a different start. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, I want to thank our engineer, Mike Cassantini at the Network Studios. And Beth, thank you so much. Thank you. Really thank enjoyed you. talking to you and learned so much. You as well. Thanks. Thank you. And that is it for this episode of Let My People Eat. Please visit our website at letmypeopleeat.com and leave us a comment. Get in touch with our email at podcast at letmypeopleeat.com or call us at 317-659-0004. We are also on Facebook. Search for Let My People Eat podcast to join the discussion. You can ask questions and suggest topics you'd like us to talk about in future episodes. If you like this show, please make sure to leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and tell your friends and family to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts. Let My People Eat is proud to be part of Jewish Coffee House, where you can find your fill of stimulating podcasts dedicated exclusively to Jewish content. Please remember that while we are certified professionals, this is not a medical advice podcast. No content, posts, or comments should be interpreted as professional guidance. Always speak to your own doctor about making the right life changes for you. Until next time, I am Jill Sharpman. And I am Andrea Moskowitz. Thanks for joining us and go in good health.